Culture can be designed intentionally rather than left to chance. What do you think is the number one issue that you're seeing in corporate America as it pertains to culture keeping? One of the issues we have in culture, and maybe this is true in leadership development, is um, only taking a programmatic approach. And the, the problem with that is there's no invitation to believe in the program. What you wanna to work towards an organizational culture is to build a movement. And the movement usually starts with a program, but the program is designed in a way to inspire the entire employee base to believe and give their unity over to the foundational belief of what this culture is designed to be. Whenever you're learning about culture, beliefs and values are synonymous. So I would say that the answer to that is to take a step deeper. Once you've identified your values, go deeper into flushing out and creating educational content that supports the beliefs of what those values are and ultimately hopefully get the buy-in from everybody that goes through it. Wow, yes, this is what I want to be a part of. And that is the power of belief that drives non-negotiable values that ultimately are designed to have an impact on every person that comes in contact with that brand. Welcome back to Spartan Leadership. I'm your host, Josh Kosnick. And as always, a friendly reminder to like, share, subscribe, review, do all those fun things uh, that uh, help us drive the impact that we're trying to have. Spartans, today we get to talk about two topics near and dear to me. So listen in, it is go time. Culture can be designed intentionally rather than left to chance. The profound words of my brother Ben, NFL Super Bowl champion, chief culture officer, and most importantly, husband and father to four little girls. Please join me in welcoming Ben Utech to the show. Welcome, brother. All right. Thanks, Josh. Excited to be here. Yeah. So, uh, you know, flying solo in the household, I see. I can't remember if I asked you this last time we connected. Did you get a, a male dog or anything to help? Uh, <laughs> Oh my gosh, I'm kind of embarrassed, embarrassed to admit it, but we we are cat owners. And so when when my when our girls, you know, wouldn't let up and we decided to give in, I, I said to my wife, look, if we're gonna get a cat, we're gonna get it get the biggest, most masculine cat that you can get. So we, we bought a <laughs> we bought a male Maine Coon and uh he's gray and black and he looks like a lynx and he's huge and and kind of badass. So I, I was really, uh, that, that's about as, that's about as much testosterone as I get, as I get now. <laughs> that's fun though. I mean, girls are such a blessing. I thought I was going to have four girls, like I told you. And, uh, you know, we snuck cam in at the end because the Cubs made it to the world series. I, <laughs> I fully, I fully attribute, uh, them going and winning the world series to, to his arrival. You know, it took 108 years for them to get back there. So, or to win one. So, uh, God bless me with a little boy there on the end, but uh, man, the girls are great. I know you were at volleyball tournaments and I got dance season, competition season kicking up go. here. So all that fun stuff. Yeah. All right. So crazy. So with all that you got going on at home, you still managed to occupy a seat at multiple organizations, an entrepreneur uh, that's about to kick off something awesome. Let's dig into this a little. First, yeah. your title, chief culture officer. Sounds straightforward. Right. But yes. I know it's no easy feat. So what exactly is it that you do? Well, I, I recently came across a, a powerful quote from Steve Jobs when he was launching Apple, uh, you know, arguably the greatest organization on the planet, right? When you look at revenue and, and its growth since inception. But, but his, his, uh, his quote was around um, the power of really of building a strategy around people and culture and, and viewing culture and people within an organization as your top line of the organization. And when you do the top line well, uh, you have scalable success. And, and so really, you know, looking at someone like Steve Jobs and, and what he's done with, with his organization um, to, to really understand the power <clears throat> of an objective strategy that that purely focuses on your most valuable asset, which is your human capital, um, and to dedicate yourself to 
to the attention, the intentionality, and the strategy of human development, which I know you're an expert in, is 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 what a chief culture officer is designed to do. It's a it's a part of the human resource uh, platform, but it's somebody who the sole dedication and devotion is to is to the culture of an organization that drives um, human flourishing. And and so I I just absolutely love it. If you would have asked me if this is where I'd end up before I started in the NFL, I, I would have thought you were crazy. But, you know, my time in that world championship locker room with Hall of Fame coach Tony Dungy and Peyton Manning and the list goes on. We've put six or seven players and coaches in the in the NFL Hall of Fame. Uh, but being around those men and the 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 new learning and understanding of the power of servant leadership just forever changes the landscape of my life. Yeah, for sure. And I want to ask about that in just a moment. But that Steve Jobs quote, uh, for those that don't know Steve Jobs story, that quote, that quote is super powerful because Steve Jobs used to be an awful boss by every and an awful culture person by by everyone that had worked with him at his first tenure at Apple before he was fired and before he came back. And so to to see the evolution of him as a leader right. and, and to have the quote that you mentioned, for those that didn't know that backstory about Jobs and how bad he was for culture as kind of a dictator in his first tenure and stint at Apple to how he evolved when he came back to Apple is really, really makes that quote that much more powerful. Yeah, because, you know, one of my mentors is a, is a world renowned uh, chief people officer, a guy named Tony Bridwell. I've uh, been in multiple Fortune 100 companies um, and is now leading a national HR firm out of Dallas. But, but Tony's always taught me over the last two years that ultimately culture has to be about the power of transformation, not confirmation, right? And so what often happens in, in, in leadership, especially during growth phases of organizations, is they take a conformative approach to people. Right, do it this way. We're not going to tell you why we want you to do it this way, but we're just going to tell you you got to do it this way. <laughs> <laughs> and you know, and it's a power and control move. Versus, how do you create a transformational culture where the individual chooses to buy in, um, and once they choose to believe in the alignment of culture principles, um, then they give you more of themselves: commitment, devotion, uh, principles like trust. Uh, just grow abundantly. And, and, and so ultimately, you know, that's really where you want to drive the culture of an organization and everything we try to do uh, with the culture operating strategy is to disrupt the, the traditional mission, vision, value statement. So I know you've probably used it. I've used it. We all use Peter Drucker's quote that culture eats strategy for breakfast. And I always ask people, is that true or false? And my platform is it's false. And the reason why I say that is because when you look at that, it narrows and puts culture in a box. But if culture is the strategy, if culture is the, the foundational strategy of an organization, it eats every meal at every time of the day. Mm. And so it's really about embracing that, believing in that. It's not the soft skills, but it's objective, it's metallic. You know, when you design it uh, intentionally and when you create practices that hold organization and its team members accountable, um, then you begin to actually get buy-in across the organization and, and, and human development. And that's, that's the key. I couldn't agree more. And you, you get to work in a lot of corporate spaces. I just want to speak to the entrepreneur real quick that may have three, 10, whatever small group of employees that you have is you... Your job is to find great talent, and I know that's very hard. But then your second job is to develop that talent endlessly. Yes. And that's through culture building. And this is where I see a lot of entrepreneurs that I coach and are around and I'm around a lot kind of fail. Is like you don't take the time, you don't realize the importance of you, the leader, pouring into those people and developing them to make them the employee and the people that you need them to be in the future. So um it's just paramount what you're saying there. And, and I love your spin on Drucker's quote. I've, I actually don't use that quote. Okay. I've heard it many of times, but I don't use it. 
And, and part of it is, I think we live in this world where everything seems to be so black and white and there's nuance to every statement mm -hmm. and there's nuance to culture and there's nuance to strategy. And so to take a quote out of context and apply that as it's gospel is just a dangerous thing for me. So any quote that I say, any, any, um, platitude, any, any different thing is like, we got to make sure that we're uh, dissecting how that fits the organization we're either speaking to or the organization that we're in and make sure that it actually is applied correctly. I love that, Josh. In fact, that, that, so when I was building, starting to build my programs coming out of the NFL, one of the things I looked at uh, internally within the offensive system of Indianapolis Colts was what we called the language of Manning. And that was, you know, the, the, the just fantastical audible system of, of Peyton Manning, right? And we would have weekly meetings where, where Peyton would, would come in with the in, Encyclopedia Peytanica, I call it. <laughs> and, and, but it was very intentional around the education of the power of words and, and taking words out of the assumption and perception fear and bringing them into the objective uh, reality sphere. And, and so the culture of communication in Indianapolis was built around what I call content, purpose, and delivery. What are you saying? Why are you saying it? And how are you saying it? And each one of those questions to, you know, to your, uh, to your comment is, is really essential in answering. You know, you, you have to define objectively what uh, the word or, or the platitude or the phrase means. Why does it have meaning? What's the psychology of it? And, and then how are you actually going to deliver it and distribute it? Because the way you speak to some departments or leaders or individuals is going to be different than you do to others because of their yeah. capacity for learning. So, yeah. Well, speaking of Manning isms, Let's settle this one and once and for all. What did Omaha mean? <laughs> I get asked two questions every time I speak. What was it like to catch a pass from Peyton Manning? And what does Omaha mean? <laughs> but it's perfect. It's a perfect example, right? Because uh, when Omaha began being used, it was an audible that allowed us to change the direction and the gap of a run play within a second. And because we ran an... Um, um, a, a, an offensive zone uh, run scheme, there would be times where Peyton would make the call to run, let's say, an outside zone run play to the right, which means the running back is going to take an angle to try to run outside of the last person on the line of scrimmage. But because of the way the defense shifted during the play call, that no longer was open. It was unavailable. But an inside zone run play on the right became open. And so you've got three seconds left on the play clock. How do you change an outside run play to the right to an inside run play to the left? One word. One word. And the word did a number of things. At it, it, first, it had to change what the, um, what the snap count was on. So when he called Omaha, it automatically went to two. So whatever the snap count was before, it went from that to on two. So it said hut, hut, and then the ball would be snapped, right? So we knew that. And then we knew that whatever the play was that was called on the right side, it would basically shift to the left and move the gap inside. And so he sees it two seconds. He sees it one second. Omaha, Omaha said hut, hut. And all of a sudden, it, it completely shifts to the uh, to the gap and in, into the to the side of the field. Yeah, I'm glad you explained that the way you did because, as a as a former football player myself, I knew uh, the terminology, and I'm sitting there thinking, last guy on the line, that's either you, the tight end, or the or the tackle. Yep. But I'm glad for a lot that didn't play football that you went into that nuance because it makes a ton of sense. Yep. All right, so I'm, I'm sure a few ears perked up when during your intro when I said NFL Super Bowl champion. If they didn't know who you were, uh, 
Ben was a fantastic tight end, and not only at the University of Minnesota, which I won't talk as much about because I'm a diehard Wisconsin Badger fan, but also uh, for the Indianapolis Colts, my wife's favorite team. All right. Uh, so how to and, and you and you talked a little bit about that. And by the way, Ben and I got to talk uh, a couple months back, and she, my wife was exper- sharing with me that he spoke at her chapel at her uh, university of uh, and- Anderson University while he was playing for the Colts because that's only about a 25 minute drive from Indianapolis. And, and so Ben's got a chance to speak to my wife and her class and, and be in these places. And before he and I even got to meet each other, it's a pretty cool experience in small world. So how did you touch on this briefly? How did your experience in the NFL specifically with Tony Dungy in that locker room contribute to your passion for culture in the workplace? Well, you know, coach Dungy also played for the university of Minnesota, go Gophers. Um, <laughs> you had to throw that in there. We, got, we dominated the, the Badgers when I was playing. So that was the Sorgi day. I re- hey, Ben, I remember. And that's why I wasn't bringing it up as much. <laughs> You've got, hey, you guys are far ahead, though, in the last 20 years. So don't worry about it. Um, but, you know, uh, Tony uh, um, was coached by Chuck Knoll. And he always told a story and he included it on the first day of of the year when, when new players would come in. And, and this is what was said to him when he was playing for the Steelers. And that was, if you're here, if you're in this room and your entire life is wrapped up in a sport, you've completely missed the purpose of your life. Mm. I mean, think about that. You know, I just remember looking around the room kind of thinking, Wow, that's that's totally new and different. And I've never heard anything like that before. And so he went on to say, you know, my job here is to build a family. And the acronym for family in football is forget about me, I love you. And it's the power of selflessness, right? How do you take 53 of the most powerful, egotistical, confident men on the planet and get them to trust and hope in each other? And that all of a sudden set a tone that I had never experienced, as you know, in, in, a, in a sport industry that traditionally leads out of fear, right? We're going to break you yeah. down, get you back up and, you know, tell you exactly what to do. And if you don't do it, you're not going to be here long, right? Which drives performance. We know it. We know it yep. works. Yep. We know it works. Um, is, it the, is it the most sustainable style of leadership? I would argue no. Um, but that's really where the seed was planted. For me, Josh, and then, and then, really, as I as I retired, and my degree was public speaking. Grew up, my dad was a pastor. Uh, I fell really in love with watching him craft a, a message designed to positively impact the human condition every week. And I thought, man, I I want to use words that way. And so when I retired, I I started asking myself, well, what's what's the story that I want to tell? And in the discovery of answering that question, it was. I need to tell the world about what was different about the Indianapolis Colts and, and that I experienced an objective approach to culture uh, designed not only to improve football players on the field, but more importantly, to improve them as human beings. And if they grow and develop as humans, their performance on the field is just going to skyrocket. And, and so that was the inspiration behind my pursuit into kind of the industry of, of culture development. That's so good. And such a great perspective by Tony, because the first time I ever had depressive thoughts in my life was when I stopped playing college football Mm. because my identity was wrapped in being a football player. Right. Yep. And, and I went to college, not to go to college, but to continue playing football which is, I, I get it, and I've told this story a few, a few different times. I get that was the wrong intention to go to college, but that was my intention. And that's why I didn't finish college, and I didn't stop playing football because I got injured or because the coach told me I shouldn't play anymore or because I chose to. I chose a different path. Right. So, but that was the first time I lost my identity. So are you saying that Tony Dungy said that to the alphas, the absolute best of the best, yep. sets a totally different tone, and I wish that every – football player, every, every person that's uh, playing at a high level, whether it's college or professional, heard that message because it'll save you 
from some pain and heartache and potentially some brain pain or mental health issues if you know that your identity is not in a helmet. If you know that your identity rests only with the Lord above and not anything earthly. So and so I'm so glad that you said that because it resonated with me so deeply. Oh, yeah. Um, yeah. And the other thing too, Josh, just, just to mention is, you know, when you start, when you start bringing in inspiration, which has to be a part of culture, by the way, but when you start bringing it in to the conversation, that that's when you get, you know, a, 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 an older fraternity's view on, on culture being uh, focused on the soft skills, right? The, the, the eye roll of, oh, we got to, you know, we got to figure out how to, you know, um, how to focus on the, you know, certain forms of, of, of treatment of people. Um, but it, it doesn't, it, it didn't negate um, the intensity of expectation, right? So while, while Dungey came at performance through human development and the importance of, you know, of really um, helping men practice the organizational belief and value system, it, it still came with a very strict level of expectation around doing your job and doing it with excellence, right? And yeah. the consequences were the same. But the way in which the communication um, was focused around human development took a different approach, which, which made it more digestible to each player even though they knew that the same consequences uh, existed uh, for, for poor performance. Yep. So you can have both. You can take a, a leadership style that, that really pours into uh, the relational side of, of your employees and at the same time provide a culture of clarity around performance expectations. Yeah, that's so good. Yeah. So let's let's uh, pivot a little bit to the corporate culture side of things. What, what do you think is the number one issue that you're seeing in corporate America as it c- pertains to culture keeping? And and do you have like an elevator pitch to resolve it? That's a big question. Um, I try to ask big questions. It's a big question. And as you know, um, because each organization has its own identity, right? You, you have to be very thoughtful um, around answering that question. But I would say generally, um, in my experience, and especially in my mentorship um, over the last two years, um, from small businesses with five employees to, to learning from people who were overseeing 65,000 employees, um, I would say that one of the issues we have in culture, and maybe this is true in leadership development, you'd have to teach me on that, is um, only taking a programmatic approach to installation, right? We're going to come in, we've got all these programs, uh, we're going to launch all these programs, and we want you to do all these programs. And the, the problem with that is there's no... Um, there's no invitation to believe in the programs. And ultimately what you want to create, what you want to work towards an organizational culture is to build a movement. You want to launch a movement throughout the organization. And the movement usually starts with the program, but the program is designed in a way to inspire the entire employee base to believe and to then give their alignment and give their unity over to the belief, the foundational belief of what this culture is is designed to be. Now, if you can capture that, you've got a group of people that have said yes, and then that becomes a waterfall effect across the entire organization. Yeah. And that's what Dungey did when he came into Indianapolis. The first thing he asked Jim Ursay when he got the job, or actually this is, was a requirement of Jim Ursay for him to say yes to the job. And that was, you have to give me the keys to the car. You have to give me total control over the organization. 
and it starts with our culture. So then what he did is he took his core belief and value system and he went to the, to the captains and he said, this is what I believe. These are the beliefs that drive my values. Will you buy in? And Peyton Manning said, yes. And Dwight Freeney said, yes. And all of the key core players of the team said, yes, Marvin Harrison, Reggie Wayne, Jeff Saturday, you know, Edger and James, and the list goes on. And, and when you get that buy-in, now every single person that is onboarded into that team who's looking up to the, these Hall of Fame players and coaches um, are now coming in with the invitation to say yes um, based upon the leadership style of, of those before them who have already said yes and have been living it out. Right. And so you, you create, mm -hmm. you create then a movement um, and that drives the, the foundational program that you start with. And so that's, yeah, yeah that's where I'd go with that. And then I, you know, as far as the second part of the question, um, Traditionally, companies, as you know, they go through mission, vision, values. It, it's always a check in the box, right? Mission, vision, value statement. Every board, mission, vision, values. And then those value statements go on a website. And the only onboarding we have into that value system, which is supposed to reflect the culture, is go read the, go read the values on the website, and, and then we hope that, that you will behave in a manner reflective of that. Mm -hmm. So... Everything that I've read in, in industrial psychology combines beliefs and values. Beliefs and values are what create every culture and subculture on the planet, whether it's organizational, whether it's um, political, religious. You can go into any country, whether it's a dictatorship or a democracy, and you can Cons consolidate their culture down to two things, beliefs and values, and how people are behaving in a manner reflective of those beliefs and values. So I would say that the, the answer to that is to take um, a step deeper in the creation of your mission, vision, values to, once you've identified your values, go, go deeper into flushing out and creating educational content that supports the beliefs of what those values are, why those, why those, you know, why do we believe in, in the values and how do we believe we should be behaving to reflect the values? All right. And that's ultimately what, what I'm doing through the culture operating strategy is building out what I call organizational culture creeds. We're going to take your value statements and we're just going to, explode those into a full onboarding culture, belief and value system so that we can, from the very beginning in the hiring process, we can capture the essence and, and teach and train and, and ultimately hopefully get the buy-in from everybody that goes through it. Wow. Yes. This is what I want to be a part of. Yeah. So every leader needs to go back and rewind this for a few minutes and, and just listen to what Ben had to say there again. And as far as it pertains to leadership development, the progr programmatic approach that companies are taking, it's if they're not explaining the why, and if their people aren't part of the plan, they won't buy into the plan. And so if they're just forced a program, they, they may do it, they may go through the motions, but you're not going to get the change that you're seeking from those people. And so everything you just said is spot on. The, um, it's interesting as you think about the culture, if I ask an entrepreneur or a business owner what their values are, maybe 50% of the time they can tell them, tell me without looking at something. If I ask them what their mission is, I'll say their, their core purpose or mission is a little bit more readily available to them. I'll give them about an 80% 80 grade there. But then if I ask what, how many of their people would be able to recite either of those. Yeah. It's a very, maybe 10%, maybe. Yeah. So the point is, and this is where I think a lot of leaders, let's say you're doing a great job and your employees could recite the values. How are they being lived? 
-hmm. And how are you teaching from them? So anytime you're doing a course correction of an employee, how does, are you inserting your value in there as to what value they're breaking or what belief they're breaking Mm -hmm. on why they, you need, you're doing a course correction or corrective action or whatever you may call it, or, or just educating them on the mistake that they made. Mm -hmm. You got to insert a core value or belief there and why that was wrong and how we're going to fix it going forward and why they shouldn't do that again. That's a teaching moment. And that's a teaching moment, not only to course correct, let's say they, it's a mechanic and they screwed up something that caused mechanics, other, uh, the other mechanics, time and effort and money on the employer. Sure. But how did that go against the core value or the mission? Let's say the mission is to get people back their car in a proper working order as fast as possible so that they can go on with their life. If that's the mission, Mm -hmm. then this is the problem that it caused by screwing that up or running through it too quickly. And you got to bring that value into the conversation. That's how you teach it. So love it. And I'll tell you, just to touch on that real quick, um, as I've been coached, uh, around, around the how, uh, there's something that is really missing within human development, especially in large organizations, because it's just, you know, there's so many people, um, it's the power of story. And you know this because sports is great at story. Mm. I mean, think about every head coach that you've ever been a part of. Think about all those team meetings that we had and think about how those coaches used the power of story to transform a mindset or an attitude within the team. It's just a part of sports. Like we, we pull from all sorts of stories to lead inspiration, ultimately to make an impact on mindset, attitude, and then physicality. And that's something that, we need to figure out how to bring back into businesses and that's to empower directors, managers, leaders who are, who are really overseeing the communities within the organization to empower them to become storytellers of the culture. So that if there is a performance mistake or error, that we're not just going back into that conformative language, why would you do that? Why would you make that such a dumb decision that you just made on the manufacturing floor? Why would you do that? That's not how we do it. Do it this way. Well, how does that person going to walk away? Are they going to walk away going, man, I can't wait to work for this, for this manager tomorrow. Or what if that manager steps up and comes alongside and says, man, I've been there. I have been in your shoes. Empathy right away. I've been where you are. In fact, let me tell you a story. Let me tell you about the time that I, you know, forgot to, you know, do this one step and here's what it costs the organization. Right. And you use that story now all of a sudden come in and now this, now, now the relationship that you're building with that person changes and the way that they respond to positive criticism or challenge changes, evaluation changes. And they walk away going, okay, that was hard. And I know I have to, I know I can't make that mistake again, or I could, I might, I might not be in this position, but the way in which I was just treated has empowered me and inspired me to do better. And that's, that's hard. I'm not saying that that's an easy thing, but it's something we've got to figure out how to teach and bring into the culture conversation. It's not easy. It's leadership. It's, (laughs) I mean, it's leadership. So yeah, if you're a leader, leadership isn't easy. However, that's the job we signed up for. So go be a leader and do what Ben said and share the story and show empathy and uh, get your, because as a leader, you're trying to inspire for them to step up the next day and do the right thing. So yeah, it's leadership. And change, change your own mindset. Just because I said the word empathy, don't hear that and go, oh, I've just, I've just got to be nice and give in. That is not what empathy is. Empathy is being able to put yourself in the position of the person you're talking to. That doesn't have to be easy, you know, and you can carry certain intensities even within your tonality and still be empathetic, right? It's just about understanding how you can use certain relational qualities 
to really drive towards excellence. That That is a brilliant point. I can have empathy for someone that deeply hurt me. And you take it, take it away from the work floor, the manufacturing floor that you were just referencing. I can have empathy for someone that deeply hurt me and what they're going through and because hurt people hurt people. Yeah. That being said, I don't have to let them back into my life. I don't have to let them back in my life to give them the chance to do that again. Right. Right. So, so you're spot on with that empathetic comment. All right. So I'm curious about your thoughts about faith in the workplace, because I know you do a lot of corporate culture, some work and faith is extremely important to both you and I, uh, as I was mentioning earlier, I don't think I mentioned this part, but like Ben was a public speaking major, then goes to the Colts. And then he was speaking at chapel at an Anderson university, which is a Christian university. So faith is very deep uh, for Ben and as all of my listeners know, so me as well, but in the corporate world, it's kind of taboo. So, so do you bring that piece to your culture strategies uh, or do you hold back or or how's, how's it work for you? So I think, you know, obviously, you know, in a, in an inclusive and, and equitable environment in an environment that, that celebrates diversity. And, and I say, I say DEI in a very, um, in a very positive way based upon how I define those, those words. Um, but, but really the care for people, you, you're, you're always very sensitive. You're always very sensitive to understanding the, the fact that every person in an organization brings their own intrinsic uh, political beliefs, religious beliefs, and you're not you're not driving towards uh, this is not an evangelism platform, right? This is this is a, a learning platform, and it's designed to go out into the ether of human development and say, okay, how do we capture, you know, how do we capture these powerful truths that exist emotionally and relationally and maybe even spiritually, and 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 utilize those um, so that we can have the greatest impact on people. So I brought this out. This is my this is my Super Bowl ring uh, here with Indianapolis, and I, I know you're probably not going to be able to see it, but on the side of the ring, at the very bottom, there is the word faith. Mm. Now, that did not have any um, religious connotation. That was uh, that was designed. The acronym for faith was freedom for all individuals to trust and hope in each other. Right. So it's taking a, it's taking what might feel like a spiritual concept and, and really focusing in on, well, what does it actually look like if we built a team that could trust and hope in each other? And if we do that, we've ultimately built such cohesion and morale around our, our departments that, that uh, it's going to be very hard to dismantle. Right. It, it becomes, you know, it becomes, uh, incredibly strong. And so Mm -hmm. the other, the other thing that um, I thought was really interesting is as I was, as I've done uh, academic studying into industrial psychology, um, as we talked about before, um, whenever you're learning about culture, beliefs and values are synonymous. They, you can't have one without the other, right? Values are empty vessels. If you don't apply beliefs about beliefs. Yeah. And so that's radically powerful. So let's talk about that for a second, right? That's not, that's not telling anybody what they have to believe. That's just identifying that, that when there's clarity around an objective belief, you actually have empowered the applicant to make a better decision whether this is the culture for them or not. And you've actually empowered the organization to protect itself better from hiring people that aren't going to share the same organizational you know, beliefs and, and values that drive the performance of the, of the organization. And so you're really, you're really using that platform in a very inclusive, equitable way, ultimately to, to, to hire and celebrate in a, in a diverse population, you know, of, of race, of, of thought. Um, and, and so ultimately that's that's kind of the lane, Josh, that I stay in. I mean, there's always opportunities when we find connection with people that are interested in going deeper into personal beliefs. And if those if those opportunities present themselves, um, then by all means, 
you know, um, if if both sides are interested in, in pursuing deeper, you can pursue that deeper. But when you look at it organizationally, what you're really doing is, is you're just bringing in concepts that are foundational to every culture that exists on the planet. And that is the power of belief that drives non-negotiable values that ultimately are designed to have an impact on every person that comes in contact with that brand. Yeah. That's really well said. I would definitely have not said that that eloquently. <laughs> that's the preacher in me. That's the that's the PK. Oh, that was great because I was more like because uh, I now work primarily with entrepreneurs, but I spent a large part of my career in that uh, Fortune 100 space, and uh, I was more as I was going down the DEI space, uh, uh, recruited and developed and and spent a lot of time with a lesbian woman in my organization. We're educating each other, and there was this time, right? Because I'm you know in the financial industry, it's mostly white male and and alpha driven and and we're creating a culture so that she can fit in and recruit others that that uh you know are, are different than the typical straight white male as well but there was a time where i didn't feel comfortable talking about my christianity and i actually worked with her to talk about i was like look if i can't talk about it i'm not being me and if if we're creating an environment where you feel comfortable but i don't feel comfortable is that an inclusive environment and we had this really beautiful dialogue. And so I, it made me more comfortable after that dialogue, being more open about my Christianity and my beliefs. Because if we're creating a truly inclusive environment, I have to show up as 100% me and also hold space for someone else to show up as 100% them as well. Yeah. But you said I, it way better. Well, I had, a, so just one other final thought on that, which is really powerful. This was a light bulb moment for me. Um, a dear friend of mine, um, uh, exceptional business lawyer, uh, international franchise of the year award winner for franchising a new um, nonprofit healthcare model for Africa. He, he built a, a company called Health Store, which um, empowered African nurses to own their own pharmacies through a nonprofit franchise model. And it worked. And there's like hundreds of locations across Africa now, um, all designed to, to provide actual medicine to the tens of thousands of children that are dying, you know, a day from malaria or things that could mm -hmm. clearly be solved with a, with real medicine in pill form. And, when he won the award, he was invited into the upper echelon of the franchise community. So he was telling me the story about sitting at a table with some of the biggest brands in franchising, global enterprises. And he said, I, Ben, I was shocked when all of a sudden, out of nowhere, the question was given at the table. And the question was, who's the greatest franchise CEO in history? And he said, every single leader at the table agreed that it was Jesus. And he goes, I'm most certain that not everybody at the table were, were people of faith, but they all agreed. If you're, you're just looking at the leadership, who's, who's one of the greatest leaders of all time that has had the greatest impact, they all agreed it was Jesus. Because yeah. one guy took a franchise operating system, if you will, taught it to 12. 12 and said, go replicate this. And today, 2.8 billion people on the planet, you know, identify Christianity as their, as their faith. So remove religion from that. Just look at it through a corporate case study lens. That shows you that belief and values are scalable and that they can create a movement. But the movement started with an operating system. The movement started with a strategy that was taught and belief structure, right? But, but the 12 said, yes, right. When the leader came and said, I have the most amazing operating strategy and brand, you got to see it. They all looked at it and they went, I'm in. And because of that, and because of the training to be able to distribute and educate and teach and coach to the operating system, over thousands of years, it just kept replicating. The movement kept going and kept going. Man, if that's not awesome, and if we can't bring that into companies, 
again, absent. This is not about this is not about proselytizing any, you know, religious belief. This is about a case study in the power of non-negotiable beliefs and values. And if you if you focus on them and you're intentional and you're willing to build out strategies and then the systems that make the strategy come to life, you've got a chance to do something radically profound uh, with the culture yeah. of your organization. And most importantly, have an impact on your bottom line that, because they, they, they're in parallel. Your people and your revenue are in parallel. And so if you can build culture um, and grow culture that people want to be a part of, where they find value and purpose, your revenue is going to explode. And that, that is ultimately what, you know, what is going to drive business and its growth. That is possibly one of the most powerful analogies I've ever heard. Right. Jesus in the franchise system. That's awesome. Yeah. All right. Uh, we're running out, man, such good conversation. We're running out of time. So I want to transition to a, a part two of this conversation. We've covered what you do by profession, but there's one endeavor we haven't touched on, and that is your true North passion. Mm. Your time in the NFL ended up abruptly. For those of us who don't know, can you share that part of the journey with us? Yeah, that was un unfortunate. I, you know, my story is one riddled with injury and on a lot of uh, different layers, those injuries, you know, really, I think, helped develop me into the, the husband and the father and the friend uh, that I am today. So I, you know, I, as much as I would want to go back and, and not go through those, those the, the refinement that, that occurred out of um, different times of suffering was, was important, but but my career did end due to a fifth documented concussion. Uh, it happened on uh, HBO Hard Knocks. We were, I was playing for the Bengals at that time. And, and um, I had had a number of concussions leading up to that that started to create some interesting cognitive changes. And when the last one occurred, <clears throat> um, we had just had our first daughter and I was having some interesting executive functioning issues and some um, some short and long term memory gaps that were just hard to explain and to be frank a little scary. Mm -hmm. And so we started, had to start asking ourselves some tough questions and and um, and the result was, you know, if I don't have a brain, I, I don't have any relevance. I, I'm, you know. And, and that's the most important part of who I am. And so we mm -hmm. we made the difficult choice um, to to walk away at that point. Um, you know, super blessed to have played two to three times the average, you know, career. And you know, even though it didn't end the way that I wanted to, um, you know, it 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 laid the foundation for for everything else that was that was to come. But that was tough. Yeah, it was a tough tough time. And so what have you done to obviously, so you, you live, you know, you have five concussions. Um, there's all these studies coming about, you know, the TRE and, or not TRE, but uh, traumatic CT. TBI or CT uh -huh. and TBI. Yep. Um, so, and then actually some of the studies done by Dr. Davidson and, um, you know, Chris Borland, our mutual friend has joined them here at UW yep. and uh, some of the studies and work that they're doing. What have you done to, you know, make sure that you're around as long as possible for your daughters and your spouse and, and make sure that you're continuing to stay in a positive mental health frame because you have such a, a powerful leadership stance in, in, in your entrepreneurial field and corporate corporations yeah. you're working for. And obviously your family's most important to you. Yeah. Um, so I, uh, you know, philanthropically, I got involved with the American Academy of Neurology in Minneapolis. Uh, they're the most prestigious neurology group in the, in the world. They represent about 30 to 40,000 neurologists um, in our country. Um, and then uh, I ultimately transitioned over to their, to their public board at the American Brain Foundation. And so that really started to, you know, open the door into being an advocate for, for brain health, um, still working alongside the NFL Players Association and, and the Mackey White Player Health and Safety Committee, uh, where, you know, such a fantastic group dedicated towards 
um, being the strongest champions for, for player health and safety. And then uh, personally, I got involved with a, a franchise company called Learning RX. And Learning RX is all across the country. And their business is in uh, cognitive strength training. And I remember thinking to myself when I heard this, um, you know, this is this is a scheme. It's a gimmick. You know, it can't be real. And so I took it. I took the, the I took the actual strategy of the company. And I brought it to my neurologist friends at the American Academy of Neurology, and they all, to my surprise, said, "No, Ben, this is this is." This is a real thing. Cognitive strengthening um, has been rudimentary neurology for decades. If you have cognitive weaknesses, you can do specific neuropsychological exercises and you can strengthen your neural pathways in your brain much like you would your biceps, hmm. much like you would your body. And I thought, well, what could go wrong? And so I spent about 150 hours over three months, four days a week, hour and a half to two hours a session, and uh, went through a, a pre and post neuropsych evaluation and and then got to work. And I'll tell you, when I started, it was um, it was embarrassing. I was in a room of open cubicles with you know 10, 11, 12 year olds that were just kicking my butt on some of the most simple exercises. Um, and it was kind of tough to, you know, to, to swallow that. But thankfully, I, I saw the benefit and I kept going. And uh, by the time I was done, I was doing things cognitively, Josh, that I had never done ever in my life. Mm. And when you look at my post um, neuropsych evaluation, the areas that I would that I had identified that I was struggling with, which um, w which the results gave evidence to to actually struggling, at the end increased by forty to sixty percent. I mean, my short oh, my awesome. long term memory went from the twelfth and seventeenth percent up to the seventy eighth and ninety eighth percent. Wow! And it was all just doing rudimentary brain exercises and and not just not just getting on my phone and doing some of the apps for five minutes a day but i mean doing them for 90 to 120 minutes every day four days a week um and my brain began as the neurologist described my brain began to actually strengthen neural pathways that had been injured and potentially create new pathways to get to a destination that had otherwise been been injured um, and had detour signs all over the place, right? And so, yeah. you know, <clears throat> uh, my wife would tell you she got her husband back after that. That's amazing. That three months, right? And I feel great now. I, you know, I, I don't know what the future holds and if CTE uh, will be a disease that I have to face like so many other players, but I know that the work that I put in and that I'll continue to do in maintenance over, over the rest of my life is going to be helpful. Did your competitive sort of drive hit in and like, I'm not going to let these 10 to 12 year olds get the best of me and over three months, just kick it into hyperdrive. <laughs> well, they try to put you into a chaotic environment. So imagine going into a room uh, with about, I don't know, 16 to 20 open cubicles. Mm -hmm. Each cubicle has a metronome. And so you go in for your session, you're sitting at a, at a table across from a coach, you've got six other students all around you, and they're all doing exercises to a specific tempo on a metronome. And so you're literally hearing click, 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 I mean, all over the place. And then you have to focus on your coach and on your metronome because you're delivering results to the exercises in timing with the tempo on your metronome at, you know, depending on the exercise. Mm. And so you come in concussed and you've got all of this, you've got all this injury that you have to overcome. And I mean, the first two weeks were like, I was sweating, you know, it was like, you know, I, I got lost in thought so many times because my coach is talking to me and they're holding up these cards and I've got to, 
react to the cards, but then I'm listening to what the person in the cubicle next to me is doing. And I hear the other, and it's just like, you know, but it was crazy because as I kept going, it was almost, you, you remember the Kevin Costner baseball movie? Um, yeah, yeah. Where he says, clear the mechanism. And all of a sudden the entire crowd becomes fades out. Yeah. That's what began to happen. That's awesome. And, and I know all, yeah. Well, I was just going to say, I know you got to go here at the top of the hour. So for one last question, you can be real brief with it because cool. I close with this every time. What is an unpopular belief that you hold to be true that most others would disagree with? What is an unpopular belief that I hold to be true? Yeah, yeah. Hill, you'd die on that others would disagree with you on. Surrender is the key to victory. Hmm. Surrender is the key to victory. The ability to, to, to let go um, of your own power and control, to, the ability to, to uh, relinquish and to give everything you have over to whatever it is that, that drives you. Obviously, for me, it's, you know, faith is a part of that. My family is a part of that. But but for me to surrender and to say, you know what, I'm going to give, I'm going to surrender all I have to this and I'm going to give it everything, I, you know, give it everything, let go, give it everything, put my trust in that, that if I, if I let go and I dedicate myself to excellence and working hard and treating people well, then victory will come. That's good. I love the explanation on that. All right. I know you got to run. This has been so impactful. Where can people file, follow you, find you? Man, I'm super active on social. So please reach out to me on Instagram at Ben Utech. Same uh, on LinkedIn. Very accessible. Really excited about launching culture operating strategy. So that that you can find at, at cultureoperatingstrategy.com. And just, you know, we're I'm getting ready to just go out and just be transformational. That's that's my that's my hope and goal. So please reach out. We'd love to love to meet you, get to know you. And if I can help you in any way, uh, I'd love to. Well, I know you've been transformational today. Anyone that tunes into this is uh, this was a great conversation, Ben. We we've every time we've talked so far, we've had great conversations. So appreciate you taking the time today. Spartans share the crap out of this episode. And if you need Ben's help, Obviously, you hear the wisdom on the cultural side. He's got it for you. Reach out. Remember, the good and great are the enemies of possible. Lead like a Spartan today. <laughs>